Fantastic. Uh, hello, everyone, and a huge thank you for taking the time to join us today for our webinar on building high performance teams, part two. Um, my name is Dutchie, and I'm the Managing Director of SWAG here at Employment Hero. Uh, I'm delighted today to be joined by our panelists, including Kate Jolly, Head of Talent at Employment Hero, and Amanda Logan, Head of People and Culture at Grow. Kate and Amanda, thank you both very much for joining us. Um, perhaps we can start by, if I can ask you to, to, to share a little bit about your backgrounds and your businesses. Kate, um, you're obviously well known to our audience already. Do you want to kick off? Yes, so very briefly, hello for anyone that doesn't know me. My name is Kate. I head up our talent acquisition function here at Employment Hero. Been with the business for just over four years now and have seen some amazing scaling during that time period. We hire globally, we're remote first. So hoping that we'll have some great insights to share today. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And Amanda, welcome. Um, we are obviously very familiar with you and your business as a, as a good, great client of ours. But do you want to share with our audience a bit more about you and, and Grow? Yeah, awesome. Um, my name is Amanda. I've been in HR for over 20 years. Financial services is one of my passions. I joined Grow around three years ago. We're three years in February. Um, Grow is a startup. We're in our scale-up journey. FinTech, we build um, really cool software for superannuation clients. So we're trying to put a dent in the universe and make Australia's lives easier by being able to access their super and do some really cool stuff with it really fast. Um, as I said, I, was in, I think I said that, I was employee number 90. We're up to about 260 now. So we're really in the scale-up journey. By the end of next year, I would imagine would be at least the 400s, 500s to go live with another two major clients. Um, really exciting time at Grow. Um, so some of these topics, are all of these topics are really relevant to us. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I love hearing those stories about uh, rapid scale ups, particularly from uh, Australian businesses. Uh, cool and superannuation are not normally words that go together. But as I said, we're, we're fairly familiar with both you as a client and also your services. But uh, so, so essentially uh, using advanced technologies, including distributed ledgers and blockchains to facilitate more secure and better access to financial services and, and other. Is that is that a fair uh, summary? Uh, Beautiful summary, hundred <laughs> percent. Fantastic. All right. Well, and also worth noting that you're you've got a couple of different models. You've got an office, you've got distributed teams, and you've also got international remote. Is that right? A hundred percent. Yeah, we've got it all here, and um, through trusted partners, it's it's made it a lot easier for us. Employment here being one of those. Yeah. Fantastic. We'll we'll get into that. Uh, Delve into that in the second half, and and perhaps that's a good segue into uh, getting a bit of an understanding. The background to this conversation is that uh, we had a, a building high performance teams webinar, and it, as a result of that, we got a lot of questions around two major areas of, of conversation. One was uh, recruiting uh, and 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 using um, uh, the most advanced technologies and techniques to to recruit, and the other was managing remote teams, both remote domestic and remote international. So. We're going to kick off with this poll, uh, and I've just asked people to share with us where, where the, the, the topics of most interest to them, and that will help us structure the conversation because we've got a lot to cover in a short period of time. Whilst that poll's up, um, as usual, we will have at the end of the webinar time for your questions. So please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screens, and we'll get to as many as possible uh, either at the end of the discussion or if we see relevant points, we've got our team, they'll be curating some surfacing some questions that might be relevant to the conversation as we go. And for any questions that we don't get to, we'll endeavour to answer them uh, after the webinar with various follow-up materials, which will include a, a recording of today's session, uh, as well as uh, some links to some demonstrations that we'll refer to as we get along. So let's have a look at that uh, Rosie, if you're able to uh, show us the results of that, all of it. Yes, that was highly predictable, wasn't it? Uh, but it looks like managing remote. Uh, but I think we're going to try and touch on everything. We might go a little deeper into remote. Um, so that's great. All right. So just as by way of, of introduction to this conversation, um, HR platforms historically have been very much associated with improving compliance and streamlining admin, saving time, those kind of things. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Employment Hero, our mission is to make employment easier and more valuable for everyone. So not just the compliance and admin. And with so many HR and people and culture professionals, we know that your ambitions is way beyond just the compliance and, and administration. It's, it's about using tools and using your expertise uh, to build great teams that help 
build great businesses. And that's what we're really trying to get to the bottom of here at Employment Hero and with this conversation today. So with most people, I'll be introduced to platforms and tools and technologies with a view to compliance and admin. We're very much going to be focusing on, on, on the extension of those and, and how HR and people and culture can help businesses by building the best teams possible. Um, so before we start, just to get a bit of a handle on the first topic, another quick poll. We're interested in what sort of recruitment methods and tools you're currently using. Now, I think you can select all that apply here. So again, um, if we can just get folks to give share with us a little bit about your perhaps your most common one or two sources of recruitment. Um, and we'll do that fairly quickly. So if you can wrap that up in three, two, one, let's have a quick look at those results. Um, again, I'm expecting job board. There it is, job boards. Employee referrals and internal recommendations. Okay, that's really interesting. And I think um, both Amanda and Kate will have a bit to say on that. Um, right, terrific. Okay, so that's fantastic. Thank you for that. That gives us some guidance. Well, to kick things off, um, let's have a bit of a chat about the most common challenges around recruitment as a bit of a way of framing this up. Kate, perhaps you can give us some examples of uh, innovative recruitment strategies that have worked well for you, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go over to Amanda. Yeah, common challenges. It's interesting that people put job boards because the feedback I'm guessing at the moment is that one of the most common challenges is job ad performance in the current market. So what most people are finding is that ads will create a lot of interest but not necessarily from suitable candidates. So as a result, if you're a HR practitioner or a hiring manager, you spend a lot of time sifting through applications, but then none of the applications are actually quite right and the role remains unfilled. So there are a few different things that you could probably try to solve for that. It's great to hear that people have been using referrals. I think that is a great solution if you harness it really effectively to narrow down the number of candidates that you're assessing, but increase the chances of those candidates being a strong fit. It's just important that you really structure it effectively so that you're not getting people just sending any person that reaches out to them on LinkedIn and might be interested as a legitimate referral. So what I'd recommend is making sure that your employees have to share how they know the referred candidate, why they're referring them for the role, and a bit more about that individual and their skill set when they're submitting the referral. And then if you're able to get, let's say, three or four good referrals, there's your shortlist and you don't actually have to post an advert if those people are a solid match. So I think that's uh, a really good tip. Obviously it would be remiss of me not to mention Smart Match. Um, you can find some really great, highly skilled, available talent in there without posting a job ad. You can very easily connect for most roles with about five to 10 relevant candidates straight away save yourself the cost of the ad and just cut out that noise of going through really high volumes of applications. We use it, the last role that we filled via Smart Match took eight days from opening the role to a signed contract, which is pretty amazing. And if you're nervous to try it and are still, still interested in using job boards, you can use them concurrently. So really recommend that everyone gives it a go. So that's job ads and I think just noise around applications at the moment. I think another really common challenge is getting people who are really invested in the business and want to put their heart and soul into it rather than finding someone that just sees it as a job. Everyone out there wants to find super invested, super engaged employees, but it's hard. So I think some common ways to tackle that that I've seen work and what's worked for us Firstly, ensuring that the mission of your organization, the vision, the values are really clear. Share it everywhere, careers page, pre-interview, etc. A really good tip if you're using an applicant tracking system is to set up an email template that's got information about the business, your mission, all that good stuff that's really enticing, really hopefully gets the candidates to buy into you as an employer send that out pre-interview. And then if they show up for the interview, they should be really bought in having read through that. And if they're not, then perhaps it's not quite a fit. Um, interrupt me if I'm going on too much, because I know that we've got a lot of uh, to go through today, Dutchie, but 
The final thing that I'll mention is just I'm hearing a lot about salaries and managing candidate salary expectations at the moment. I think a lot of organisations are struggling to know whether or not they are paying appropriately for their roles. Are they underpaying? Are they overpaying? It's a really difficult balance to strike. And I think it's especially difficult for SMEs because a lot of the benchmarking will take into account enterprise organizations that are looking for different types of candidates and just have very different expectations. Also, a lot of the information that's shared on places like Glassdoor, for example, is self-reported. So it's difficult to know whether or not it's accurate. And if you use something like a recruitment agency salary survey, Typically, not in every case, but typically it's based off of a very small data set. So it's really, really hard when you're going into that negotiation process. Um, again, we have a tool for that. Check it out. If you go onto our Smart Match website, we've got real time salary data from over 300,000 businesses. It's not self reported. It's aggregated and it's anonymized data that's taken from our platform. It is a really great way to sense check the median salary for any role. So check it out. It's live throughout the whole of Australia and UK is coming soon and Southeast Asia soon after. And I'm going to shut up and let <laughs> Amanda talk. There's a lot there. Thanks for that, Kate. I think um, the 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 um, label that, that some people may not be familiar with is employee value proposition, but you touched on there and you were talking about getting your brand, getting your business information and why people might want to work for you out there. And perhaps Amanda can touch on that a little bit in, in her response. But Amanda, over to you. I mean, in terms of, you know, the com common challenges that, that you, you face at Grow or that you see your peers facing? Yeah, um, I guess in addition to Kate's, for us, I haven't seen the market like this in a long time in all my experience. I think for us, it's truly a candidate's market. You know, they'll be going for interviews and it, it's the speed that we operate with them. You know, they could be going and have one or two offers on the boil at the same time, which is quite frustrating when you're trying to sell the story and sell the opportunity that you have in front. So for us, it's about speed. We have an internal talent team, which makes it a little bit easier for us. We don't use recruitment agencies per se. Um, so our, our guys can act, I guess, quickly and swiftly. They've got a direct line of sight to the leaders, our people leaders, so they can get in there a bit quicker. So for us, it's about speed, um, getting back to the candidates um, and having an engagement, engaging experience. Dutch, you talked about your EVP. It's for us, it's, it's about that, you know, how to, why would someone want to join Grow versus down the road? You know, we need to make it really sticky for them, even when they, they start the process, they don't want to leave it. Um, so really, um, for us, it's about speed, constant communication, keeping them updated. We get a lot of feedback from candidates saying that our recruiters are doing that with them, which is great. Um, and the other thing I think we've really had to change um, and keep an open mind in the shape of our organisation and what kind of people we're employing. So we can't be so traditional and um, inflexible thinking we just need a permanent person in here. We need to think about, you know, do we do a fixed term contract? Do we do contractors for a short period of time until we find someone? Um, we've been fortunate enough that we have an operation in the Philippines. They're employed through Global Employment Hero. Um, and so we're actually looking at how do we expand that, op that opportunity over there there's a untapped resources over there and some great candidates how do we get and how do we build that team uh, last week we joined um, forces with remote hero which is an arm of employment hero um, so they're like a recruitment agency um, for employment hero and probably not doing them justice in their their um their their lib but they're um they've sent us through a number of candidates already and we only joined with them last week and that's just to build the footprint you know and they it's a one-stop shop it's been great um so you just have to think we just have to think differently in this kind of market like as Kate was saying as well we have to think of all different things yeah thanks for that we might come back to um, international hiring yeah. as part of the second half of this conversation sure. but in terms of um, grows EVP and again for those who aren't familiar with the expression employee value proposition it's really just a, a, an expression to uh, reflect the way in which you your brand as an employer, the reasons people should want to come and work for you beyond just salary, what's exciting about your organisation. What are some of the ways in which, uh, what, what is Grow sort of EVP as an, as an exciting high-paced um, growth, growth business? Mm -hmm. I think that's probably core to it. But how do, you, how do you get that out there? What are some of the practical ways that a business can get their EVP mm -hmm. out into the market? Yeah. 
For us, because we are trying to disrupt the market and we are winning big clients that we never thought we would win or we we thought would win them, but, you know, it's people in the industry may not have thought we'd win them. That's kind of helped us a lot. The other thing that we've done is we've spent a lot of time up uplifting and um, redoing our whole LinkedIn profile, to be honest. Um, we advertise and we, it's kind of like, well, it is social media. We post on LinkedIn every two, every second day, every third day, really, you know, value add important stories. It's just not something for the sake of a, a click. Um, but we've spent a bit of time on that. We've got a lifestyle page on our LinkedIn, on our LinkedIn page now, just getting some more traffic. We've had lots of, um, a lot of traffic through there, which has helped us. Yeah, I think um, LinkedIn's a useful tool. I know that Kate's team, Kate and her team use it. Um, I'd, I'd also pick up from that that recruitment isn't something that you start when you have a vacant role. Recruitment is successful recruitment or, or really high class recruitment happens all the time. Is Kate or, or Amanda, do you want to reflect on, on that? Yeah, for sure. I think it has to be, of course, you're going to have some short term tactical initiatives that you roll out when you're really actively hiring and need someone in the door. But you have to have those more long term plays around how you build your brand, how you go out and find candidates, how you generate really great referrals, all the content creation that then makes it that much quicker and smoother and easier when you do really need to fill a vacancy quickly. Yeah, and I guess that's easier for larger organisations like Grow and, and Employment Hero, I guess, for smaller businesses. It's still important that you are present, like, for example, Amanda, posting through LinkedIn, keeping your, your business and your, your objectives and your mission and your values out there on LinkedIn. And I think that's something that anyone can do. It doesn't necessarily take a lot of time. It, it can be quite simple things, but it becomes incredibly powerful because when a candidate comes in to apply for a role, a lot of the things that they look at will be the news articles on your business, but your LinkedIn profile and what you've been posting over the last year or so. So I think that's a really important tip. But um, uh, uh, Amanda, you mentioned that we're, we're in a bit of a candidate's market at the moment. I, I have a sense that we might be at the peak of that, that the pendulum <laughs> may start to turn. But, but given the high cost of vacant roles, I think people should fully understand that, that vacancies and employee churn has a high cost and leaving those roles open can really uh, impact the growth of your business. Let's talk a little bit about how companies can balance the need for, for, for that speed in hiring, that you know, minimizing those, those vacant roles, uh, but also balance that against the necessity of, of maintaining a high standard and, and what tools and processes you, and tips you have there. Again, Kate, do you wanna share a little bit about uh, your experience there? Sure. Yeah. So I think, again, you have to balance those sort of long term initiatives and then also some tactical things to get some more quick wins. So a really great sort of mid to long term initiative is to introduce a way of measuring your quality of hire. It could be a hiring manager survey that gets sent to them when the employees may be four to six months in. It might be based off of their performance appraisal results whatever, there are a multitude of different ways of, of doing it, select what you think is the best fit for your business. But if you monitor those results closely, and then use that data to inform your future hiring strategies and initiatives, you will start to see some really good results. So for example, if you find that like a significant portion of your hires don't work out because they don't have quite the right attitude, then that gives you a really clear thing to focus on, you need to revamp your hiring processes to test much more thoroughly for that and place a lot more weight on that when you're going through your interview process, designing it, thinking about who's sitting in, all the rest of it. So really recommend that as, as a long-term initiative. In terms of some quick wins and how to actually speed the hiring process up while balancing that with quality, I would recommend focusing on like speeding up the time taken between interviews, time taken to share feedback. For example, maybe the candidate does three interviews in one week, first round Monday, second round Wednesday, third round Friday. So you can move through the stages quickly, but then balance that by maintaining a sufficiently long hiring process with plenty of stages and plenty of time spent with different members of the hiring panel. So reduce all the administrative stuff, advertising, waiting for feedback, scheduling, but then maximize the time you're actually spending assessing that candidate and checking the fit. 
Yeah, so so having that process where one interview finishes and they go, we'll be in touch, uh, and then waiting a week or two before the next step is 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 not helpful. I, I I hear that. I guess that requires collaboration with your hiring managers. And I know Kate, you've spent you've invested a lot in in trying to get uh, your hiring managers as partners to your team. So making sure that you're on board and got them and they understand the importance of of quick turnarounds and and fast decisions. Okay, fantastic. And Amanda, um, from your perspective, what what how do you balance that need? Yeah, I guess just to mirror Kate's Kate's point, speed's critical. So for us, it's about high communication. We, as I said before, we have an internal talent team. So I think they've got a bit of an, a bit of a, a leg up in that they can have direct access to the leaders. They can walk out on the floor if they're in the office and go, hey, you're not returning my Slack. What's that? How was that candidate? Um, so that's really important. We've done, we've reviewed our entire process um, similar to make, you know, we want to have high touch points and lots, lots of touch points, but at the same time, we we want to make it quite efficient, a good use of their time. In some tech roles, so for like an engineer, for example, we might do an, a tech interview first um, in the as part of the sourcing or the screening process. So my talent guys will have four or five tech questions to ask. If they pass through that, then we'll hand them over to a team leader just to, 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 to I guess, shorten the process a bit. Then we'll dip into some, you know, more of a tech interview and some culture stuff is really important for us as well um, to make sure we're covering that off. Yeah, getting those those people engaged with the uh, with with the existing team is really important. And and given that you're about to, what did you say earlier? You, you've got what's your goal for this year in terms of recruitment? Uh, this year we'll we'll at least get to another fifty a hundred people, and then towards the end of next year, I would say would be at least four hundred, nearly to five hundred yeah. people. Okay, so yeah, you're really so happy huge. To explore yeah. all avenues and opportunities, as you said at the outset. Um, I'm going to throw in here a question. I'm going to bring one of the questions up that's been asked, um, because I do think it, it's, you're, you, you two might actually be on the other side of this equation, but but we've had a question around, um, uh, they've referred to them as tier one and tier two businesses, but I think what they're sort of saying is, you know, you've got the majors, you've got the brands that are well known versus mm -hmm. their business, which perhaps I suspect is, is less well known, and they're struggling to fight to recruit. Um, the question is, how do you compete as a smaller business against a bigger business, I think is the answer, is the, is the, is the question. Um, they have a fantastic EVP. They've invested in, their, in developing their EVP. What else can they do? So specifically, Amanda, as a, as a, when you were a smaller business, when people were doubting that you were ever going to be able to take on a very large multinational industry and win, how, how, how did you try and convince people to join and grow? Oh, oh and sorry, specifically, I think they've referenced salaries as an area where they struggle to compete. Right. Yeah, salaries is a difficult one. I'll have to, I'll think about that and come back to you. I think for us, it was about just building presence in in the market. You know, we have an EVP, how do you get that out? And it's about, I keep saying my internal talent team, but they just used to send out so many source, like they'd go out to source. So not only do we post an ad and we get candidates to apply, we also do headhunting and sourcing ourselves. So the team will set up projects on LinkedIn and then they'll, or whatever job boards, et cetera, they'll set up a project and they'll have to do outreach. You know, you may send out about, 100 in mails and you'll need to you know do that through LinkedIn and you may not get that many replies back but it's about the headhunting as well um, once you get the candidate like or you get contact with the candidate it's about then having and bringing that EVP to life having a really engaging story talking about why grow why would you join your organization and we've used different mediums for that you know we're in the process at the moment where we're using we're trying to film some little videos and some vlogs to share to candidates before they join um, some really fun interactive stuff to make it different you know you've got to stand out yeah, it's an interesting point in terms of other forms of media, social media videos. There's a lot of tools available. If you're sitting there listening to this and going, oh, I can't do that, have another look at it. And I don't know if, you, if either of you can recommend some tools, but I am aware that producing a short video and getting that published on LinkedIn as part of yeah. your 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 company profile is not a difficult thing to do. So that's a mm. that's a fantastic tip. Um, Kate, just digging in, diving into LinkedIn for a little bit, or sorry, diving into the idea of headhunting. Um, again, you know, you can cast your mind back to when Employment Hero didn't have a dozen people doing this, uh, and and a lot of people didn't know who we were. What what are some of your top tips for getting people to consider a business that perhaps isn't one of the best known companies or in their industry? 
Yeah, I actually think there's a lot of opportunity for small businesses. You know, transparently, we've had people leave employment here before and join a much smaller business. It had nothing to do with how big the brand was. It was more about the opportunity and they just felt it was the right fit for them. I think one thing to lean into as a smaller business is people who are really ambitious for career growth in a smaller organization there is a much higher likelihood that your career will really accelerate early on. So if you can get someone that's perhaps a touch earlier in their career, potentially depending on the nature of the role, really hungry and ambitious and really wants to climb the ladder, so to speak, that can be a great kind of portfolio of talent to tap into. The other thing I would say is that often it's less about your headcount or your revenue and it's more about the opportunity and the nature of the work that they're going to be doing if you are an organization that believes in exceptionalism you produce really high quality work you are fantastic at what you do you're really proud of that I think a lot of candidates are drawn to that often why they might be drawn to a big business is because there's a perception perhaps that that's where they'll get the best experience that's where they'll learn from the best people but if you're a small business you might still be able to offer that I think it's just about really showcasing that in your headhunting, you can try a pitch deck. We use those. It's a, a PDF that articulates more about the business, the role. We use, you know, Canva and other things so that there's good graphics in there. It's very engaging. Try a video. We use Loom. There's a, a bunch of different things that you can try to make it particularly engaging on that, that initial outreach. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I think the particular question that came in was in a trade industry, and I think uh, coming back to doing good work, quality, customer satisfaction. I think as a as a as a young tradie or even an older tradie, um, knowing that you're working for a high quality organisation as against a place which is just a churn and burn because of the volumes and size would be one opportunity there. Um, one uh, observation that came in, it wasn't so much a question as an observation, is is perks and. I think uh, this is an area, Kate, that you've invest we've invested in quite heavily. I'm less familiar with Grow, but you know, what role do perks play in distinguishing yourself? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question because it all depends on the candidate. Everyone has got something different that they're looking for. For some, it's salary. For some, it's remote work. For some, it's flexibility. For some, it's perks. I think, generally speaking, the best way to think of perks is that they should support the messaging that you have across your whole business and what you stand for. So I think we talked about this a little bit in a webinar previously, Dachi, but I know that Airbnb, all of their perks, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but they linked to their mission. So people would get to, you know, more time off for traveling and the opportunity to go and work remotely. It kind of was relevant to and all tied into what the business stood for. I think if you're not careful, you can get caught up giving perks for perks sake. But actually, you want to make sure that what you're offering is relevant to your mission and then you're attracting the right sort of people. That's probably, um, yeah, the best best summary I could give on perks. Yeah. All right. Amanda, I don't know if you've got any strong thoughts around uh, around that. No, nothing further. We're in the process as we said, as I said, we're still building out our big our business, you know. Um, mm. so we're in the process of reviewing our perks now and our benefits. Yeah. One thing I'd say around perks is whatever you decide on, make sure you articulate it and communicate it really well, because there's no point having them if people don't fully understand them. And uh, and that's that. Um, so moving into the, the, the next question, which is around sort of specialized skills. And I, I saw a question pop up, which has, I think, been answered uh, online, but it was actually referring to NDIS. And, and I think the essence of the question was super competitive space high turnover as people sort of jump between roles, high, high employee mobility. Um, so perhaps we can keep that in mind as we think about specialised skills. Um, and just to mix it up, Amanda, I might come to you first with your with your uh, emphasis on technology. But are there, it, when, when you're thinking about deeply specialised areas, you know, what, what are the platforms you recommend in terms of trying to get that diverse candidate base and, and, and maximise your breadth? Yeah, um, we... Uh... We, our organization's funny. When I first, as I first joined, the shape of the organization is changing. So we're really heavily focused on the tech side, the engineering side, and we we're struggling to find some ca good candidates around that. So we put a lot of emphasis on that. The pendulum has shifted. You know, we have a good supply, good pipeline of engineer candidates, and we've done that through, you know, building up our presence on LinkedIn, um, employee referrals, the internal talent team, et cetera, and using other tools available to us. The pendulum, it has swung, and it's more now in the space where we're 
challenged for specialist skills because our organization's aging around, you know, transition, superannuation, project management, all those types of skill set. Um, so for us, we have the most crazy unique skill we're looking for something so particular this unicorn out there that sometimes we're forced to have to go to or not forced sometimes we'll have to partner with a contractor and do that for a period of time until we find our unicorn um, and then when you get them how do you hold on to them it's really important um, that's such a key uh, but like you were saying before like we were saying before the absence of that skill set it can delay projects it can delay delivery so we need to think differently and keep an open mind um, within reason obviously with in budget, etc., and that's why I guess also we've tapped into maybe looking outside different markets. You know, increasing our footprint in in other areas. We're starting in the Philippines because we have a team there, a good core group of people. But we have had staff here that have wanted to move to like Hong Kong or to um, New Zealand, and we've supported that through again um, the help of our our global our global arrangements. Yeah. Uh, and actually just sort of reflecting on your team in the Philippines, originally you worked with a business process outsourcer, which just yes. to be clear in terms of what that means, they recruited, employed, trained and retained the team and allocated them to work to you. And then a couple of years ago, you guys made the decision that you wanted to have a closer, more direct relationship. So you've moved them, as you said, to global teams through Employment Hero. Um, what what What's that done for that team in terms of mm. engagement? Interesting. It's it's it's, it's, it's a complete uh, three hundred and sixty. They've um is that the what you say or one hundred and eighty? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a complete spin. Um, they've um they're part of the team. It's just they're they're located somewhere else. They they're treated as part of us. They feel um confident, secure, comfortable. Um, they've it's it's been awesome. And yeah. it's also I think for us it's about being able to bring in the right people from a cultural fit um, because they're so close to the business and we get to, we have a say in that. We get to help choose and we get, we recruit. Um, it's not, it's not arm's distance. You know, they're, they're close to us. Yeah. And you've touched on retention earlier, just a moment mm -hmm. ago. Yeah, Retaining a great employee is so much easier than trying to find, hire yeah. and train up a new one. So that we, we actually discussed retention as part of the original uh, episode. So if you haven't heard that, you can, you can download that online and watch that around retention. Kate, in terms of specialized areas and, and out of the box thinking that you use to, to, to broaden the pool, uh, do you want to just cover that? And then we might move on to remote work. Sure. Yeah. So I think you just have to have a bit of a test and learn approach with this. Be willing to give anything a go. And if it doesn't work, move on. We've tried everything. TikTok, Reddit, you name it. We've tried it and we've had some quite mixed results, but we're always willing to give something a try. I think in terms of deciding where to place your bets, where to experiment, think about where the kind of talent you're looking for actually spends their time. So for example, if you're mainly looking for senior roles, obviously don't, don't invest the time and, and the money in grad fairs. Similarly, don't spend all your time at like a Sydney-based networking event if actually you are remote and you're quite happy to hire someone in the Philippines. Another really great tip is to, if you have a candidate in process, whether they end up accepting the role or not, if they have that desired niche skill set that you're looking for, ask them how their job search is going, ask them what tools, what platforms, whatever they use to find work, and they might share some gems. We've definitely picked up a few tips over the years doing that. Yeah. And, and one other area, Kate, which I know you've invested heavily in over the years, and, and particularly recently, is don't be afraid to go and have conversations with people, even if they're not actively looking, even if perhaps you're not specifically trying to hire for a particular role, building those relationships with key people. Can you just share something with us about what you do there? Sure. Yeah. So often if there's a particular profile of person that we know is just generally a really great fit for employment hero, even if we don't have a live vacancy that they are specifically a good fit for, if we've got the time, we will definitely spend a few hours a week trying to tap into that talent pool, see if we can coax them into having an introductory conversation. And then when something does become available, we have them ready to tap on the shoulder. It's hard to do. It does take a lot of time investment upfront and you don't see the immediate return on investment sometimes, which is hard. But if you can try and block out a couple of hours a week for it, it can be really, really valuable. Fantastic. All right. Thank you very much for that. I'm conscious of time. We want to switch to the other area that people wanted to hear more about, and that's uh, managing remote remote teams. Uh, it is very very highly related to building better teams and, and building high performance teams because 
being able to offer remote work is not just a perk that people might be attracted to come and work for you with. It does genuinely expand your, your talent pool and the availability of staff um, within your budget or uh, in terms of particular skill sets and experience and qualifications that you might need. So let me kick it off. Kate, can you perhaps give us a, a bit of a view, a bit of a, a an insight into your views on the differences between a fully office-based or and or hybrid team versus a fully remote team? What are the what are the key strategies that you've had an effective in trying to to build out our remote business? Sure. Yeah. So for anyone that doesn't know, Employment Hero is remote first. So most of my experience has been over the last few years in a fully remote environment. Something that I think is, is a consideration for both remote and hybrid is consistency. So making sure that regardless of whether someone's in the hub that day or not, or if they're based in Sydney or over in the Philippines, they still have an equal experience working for you and they are working towards the same set of principles. So for example, if you are a hybrid business and you're hosting meetings when some people are in the hub, some people are working from home, thinking about how to make that meeting a good experience for everyone dialing in without people that are at home feeling like they are at some sort of disadvantage. Um, so that's perhaps something that is applicable for both and is important. Now, maybe I'll focus a bit more on fully remote because that's more where our expertise is. So I think one of the biggest differences when you are fully remote is that you need to be incredibly deliberate about how you build connections. So we use several things. We do quarterly socials by region. We have an annual global gathering where we try to get everyone together. We also do a virtual fortnightly all hands. So that's not in person, but I think it's still a really effective and important connection point. Uh, and actually, we also have our own podcast called Let's Get Connected, which two internal employees run and share every couple of weeks so that people are still getting that social connection and getting to know people throughout the wider business. I think all of that certainly helps, but you do still have to be quite realistic. Working remotely is never going to be quite the same as working in person. So coming back to that, that hiring conversation we were having earlier, if you are remote, it is so important that you hire the right people. If you bring someone into the team who really struggles in that environment, who is not very self-motivated, whatever it might be, it can cause so many problems down the line. So focus on those social connections and how you can build that up as much as possible when remote, but also really thinking about bringing the right people into the business and making sure that you're building a team that is set up for success in a remote environment in the first place. Uh, there's probably more I could add, but maybe Amanda, I'll, I'll let you talk for a yeah. bit. And, and Kate, I want to uh, deliberate is the word I'm probably going to come back to, you know, doing mm. it deliberately and purposefully. Um, and I might also ask you just to have a think around the importance of uh, aligning our objectives and having a clear mission and, and, and OKRs and the roles those play. But in the meantime, Amanda, I want to get to your views because Grow is quite unique in that you have mm. fully remote, hybrid office space. You've got the lot, don't you? How, yeah. how are you managing that? I'm conscious that I've got some questions around culture. We're going to come on to that. Perhaps you can start with just dealing with the practicalities and then we'll deep dive into culture. Yeah. Um, similar to Kate's, we are hybrid. Um, we have a, a spread across Australia and the Philippines, obviously. I think um, for us, it's about trying to create a consistent process and a consistent experience from day dot, from onboarding um, and from recruitment. So we'll do... Um, again, a deliberate approach in that we want everybody to have the similar, have a similar experience when they join from day one. We, um, day one, we try and get everybody in a office so that they have that face-to-face -face contact. It doesn't work in the Philippines, obviously, but for the other states and, and places in Australia, we are doing that. Um, so for us, it's about being consistent and trying to build connections. I know for my team, for example, we use Slack a lot and the company uses Slack. We have a not, I have a not negotiable one day in the office a week and I'd hopefully more managers will do that. We've just moved offices and we've got this beautiful space in, in Elizabeth Street. So we have a not negotiable every Tuesday. We're all in the office, my team. We have lunch together. Every morning we message each other on, um, on Slack. Um, we have a team meeting on a Tuesday in person. Um, our company has a fortnightly, similar to Employment Hero, we have a fortnightly town hall um, where all cameras are on. Um, and if people are in the office, they all sit in a room together um, and, and do the do the meeting. Meeting. Um, it's just the little things, you know, even on a Friday, my team will meet for a wind down and it's not wine as in 
drinking a glass of wine, but it's a wine down, you know, how was the week? What did you enjoy about it? What are you doing on the weekend? It's those little things. Um, it's about using technology not to replace, but to enhance and to, and to complement all the other stuff, you know, it's so different working, you know, in the office when you're out of the office, etc. We all know that. But so how do you how do you replicate those connections and build those connections? Yeah, okay. And I, I just want to use this as a segue into this this deliberate and purposeful. I think um just to offer my reflection on this, when when the world went remote by force uh in 2020, a lot of people just sort of lifted and shifted the way of working that they had in the office to from your desk at home. Uh, and we don't call it working from home. We call it remote work for that specific purpose. And I think I've heard Kate say that on a number of occasions. Um, so, so you have to accept that actually the investment that we've made as businesses over centuries in office-based working or site-based working has resulted in some very clear, deliberate processes and practices. And people talk about these water cooler moments, but I think they're, they're probably not as big an impact on businesses. If you're able to take that same level of deliberate design purposefulness and invest that into remote ways of working, I think people will realize they'll have a fundamentally more successful and productive result. And Kate, I might just come back to you in terms of um, some additional ways in which we do that at Employment Hero, uh, alignment on mission, clarity around where we're going. Yes, you're not standing there as a manager looking over the shoulder of your employee, but you don't have to because they know what they've got to get done and you can see them doing it. Can you share a little bit more about how we manage that? Sure. Yeah. So obviously in a, in a remote environment, people are less visible. So how you set targets and how you measure performance is especially important. I think we've had a very strong record of measuring based on outcomes, not inputs. If someone is not meeting targets and their work is not of a good quality, that's your sign to intervene and have a conversation with them around it. Even if, for example, they're online on Slack for a long period of time, or it looks like a lot of hours are being spent, you really have to focus on outcomes, I think, when you're remote. Very objective, easy to track, and put in place some way of measuring it on a daily basis. If it's, I think of like the go-to-market team and revenue targets, they would use Salesforce. We use something called Pigment. We also have our company-wide OKRs that obviously we use in Employment Hero. Just make sure you've got an easy dashboard to track performance and keep on top of it would be a good tip. Coming back to your comment, Dutchie, around mission, vision, values, how you ingrain all of that. There are a bunch of different ways to think about it. Obviously we use reward and recognition. So people who are living our values and are aligned to our DNA will get recognized for that in the platform. We also host values champion awards every year. So people who have been most recognized and most acknowledged for being aligned to our ways of working also have the opportunity to win certain prizes and get some extra acknowledgement for it. I would say that you could also embed that much more deeply into the whole employee life cycle. So we talked about hiring for the right people. We've talked about reward and recognition. Think also about your onboarding. How can you really effectively onboard people so that they are invested in your mission, understand what good looks like, know what their targets are, just set them up for success from day one. And you can probably also really weave that into your performance appraisal process as well. So rather than just measuring someone's performance based on day-to-day -day activity in the role, introduce, you know, are they a good fit for the culture? Are they working effectively remotely? Whatever it is that you value as an organization, make sure that the individual is measured against that as well as day-to-day -day performance in role. Yeah, fantastic. We talk about values a lot, um, which we're, I've got mine on the, the back of the door in my, my office here at home. Uh, but but shout outs you touched on. Shout outs are just a, an incredibly cost effect free uh, way of, of, of encouraging people to live and show and demonstrate uh, your, your ways of working, your company values. If you've got employment here already and you're not using shout outs, please look at some of the, the help articles, get them uh, activated. It's very simple. You just need to really make sure your employees are aware that it's there. They love giving out acknowledgement to their colleagues who have, have come along and helped and gone above and beyond. And it's just a way of, of, of building that sense of community remotely. So, so if you're using Employment Hero and you're not using shout outs, please go away and have a look at that. Awesome. We've had a question from Eva, which I think is a great segue into our next topic, which is around um, 
culture. Um, Eva's business has approximately 60 offshore workers. Amanda, I'm coming to you for this one because they've got uh, 60 uh, staff in the Philippines. Um, they're struggling a little bit with, with, with cultural fit, which I'm not sure if she means that from a recruitment perspective or specifically from just a culture, ongoing culture. Um, how, how is Grow uh, manoeuvring through that? How do you manage that cultural fit with your um, fully remote, internationally remote teams? Yeah, for those guys, um, it's part of our recruitment process. So we have, um, it's called the Grow Way. We have a number of behaviours that are really important to us, our desired culture, what we want to be and what we want to see more of in the organisation. So we recruit against those and we get managers and leaders to ask questions around around those so we can assess. Um, what happens then is obviously... Um, we have um, the guys are remote, uh, the, the guys are over there, but they report through to a team lead potentially that's based in Australia. So they have, they're embedded in the teams. They're not a separate team. So if you've got 20 people over there, they could be part of like 20 teams here. It's not just one team over there in isolation. We've embedded them into our teams. So they were working next to and um, remotely um, peers that are in, in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, where, where have you. Um, so we found that's, that's helped. Um, they're all part of the, and they're also part of all the ceremonies, the team meetings, everything. They're, they're just, it's, it's, they're part of us. It's, it's hard to explain it more than that. Um, yeah. yeah. But it's that idea that they're not a separate remote team to themselves. They are yeah. in the team. Yeah. And this comes back to sort of that deliberate nature that we, we we talked about earlier. Look, I might come back to you with some further thoughts on this, but um, Kate, in terms of specific tools and specific uh, ways of working, what what are the fundamentals to to your to, to the remote success that you've seen? Yeah, well, speaking firsthand, I suppose what's worked for us, I can share. So obviously, we use Employment Hero. We also use Slack and we recently upgraded to the enterprise version of Slack. And I think that's been a really good way of making sure that people have got an opportunity to connect async across different time zones, but it also increases the visibility of information. So one thing that we are really pushing for and we've had really good results from is encouraging people not just to connect via a DM on Slack, but actually we have a lot of channels that link to our OKRs or different initiatives across the business and people will share messages in there. So there's a lot of visibility of information. We also use Confluence. We have a really strong culture of documentation. I think that's super important in remote work and has been a really great tool for us as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of uh, other best practices, uh, you, you touched on it earlier. I think we have to acknowledge that remote work is not for everyone. In fact, I've been involved in interviews uh, where somebody has expressed a view that that without um, a site-based office at least a few days a week, they, they, they didn't want to work for us. And, and that's going to be, you know, 20% of the workforce. Equally, we have to acknowledge there's a big percentage of the workforce, a similar size piece of the workforce, that really lean very hard towards remote work for, for a bunch of reasons. It might be uh, physical capabilities. It might be personal and emotional introvert type qualities. Uh, have you seen, do, do we recruit for that? Do we retain for that? Have you seen a shift towards those kind of people in our business? Yes, we recruit for it very heavily. So as an organisation, we have a document where we've really clearly defined our values, our operating principles. We call it the EH way. We are crystal clear on what that looks like. It's very objective. And we have embedded that into our recruitment process and also beyond with all those things we just touched on before. So particularly during the recruitment process, there are a couple of key things we do. Firstly, we have some very structured interview questions that focus on the different components of the EH way that we really test those people against. And for us, being remote is a really large part of that. We ask a lot of questions around how people are managing their time remotely, if they're a leader, how they build a high performing team when they're remote, et cetera. We also send them the document and the PDF to review in their own time. And we are also really, really transparent about both the upsides and the downsides of remote work, because sometimes people may not have worked remotely before they join and they think it's for them. And maybe four or five months later, they're really struggling. I think being super transparent about both the pros and the cons is the best way to make sure that if someone is not going to be a fit, 
they're quite likely to self-select out partway through the recruitment process. And while that slows you down temporarily, it might actually save you a lot of headaches, you know, four, five, six months down the track. So don't be nervous about communicating both the pros and the cons. Be really transparent. Give people the opportunity to self-select out if it's not a fit and make sure that you have those really tailored questions throughout your hiring process that are testing the remote first alignment. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. I'm going to keep moving along. Amanda, just coming back to you in terms of those practical tips um, in, for managing remote, you mentioned earlier video town halls, those kind of uh, connections. Is there anything that we haven't covered off in terms of specific practical goals? No, I don't think so. I, th uh, I think we, as as we said, you know, we use Slack, Coltramp, we do surveys, we do a pulse survey, et cetera. It's just, um, it's just been consistent. And I think for some things it's about um, choosing your audience, choosing your method and your audience, you know, for us, what I'm trying to say, like if there's a really important announcement to make or information to share, we won't send an email. The CEO would rather just grab everybody for 15 minutes. You might have people on high alert for the first waiting to go, what's that 15 minutes about? But it's just so critical for us. You know, if we win a client, if we've got to move back a project, if someone's leaving or someone's joining, just having that face-to-face -face is so critical rather than just sending an email that could go for pages. Um, just those little tips it's just about building connections and bringing stuff to life really yeah um we've had a question that sort of you might be able to help us with um th th there's a there's, there's discussion and talk around remote fatigue uh i think from my personal perspective uh it comes back to that idea i want to be really careful around how i word this but the the, the muscle memory and the habits that have formed over centuries of office-based work might make it feel like it's easier to supervise and manage someone when they're directly in front of you and showing up every day. But I think what I've learned from going remote is that showing up is not a sign of productivity. FaceTime is not a sign of productivity. And actually, if we were to manage people to full productivity, whether they're site-based or remote-based, it is fatiguing as a manager. It takes effort. But are there any, is there anything around um, remote that, that, that you guys do from the, to try and alleviate managers and support managers who are managing remote teams? We talk about it. So we have um, every fortnight, we have a fortnightly, it's a food for thought. So all our team leads across the organisation get together and we have opportunities to impart knowledge, share information, do coaching sessions, et cetera. But in some of the topics, it's just having a chat. And when there's a big event that's happened or, you know, if you have to have a difficult conversation, it's about allowing extra time for them, for a leader or even the staff member just to decompress, to vent, to debrief um, you know sometimes you'll be having challenging conversations at your kitchen table um, and to hang up and then okay now I'm going to go make dinner oh, or I'm going to do this it just feels a bit you know we have to learn better ways of doing that so being able to you know close the laptop move away don't answer after a certain time if you're yeah. having a hard conversation try and do it where kids aren't walking past from school um, all those types of things it's just about thinking differently and being yeah. really thoughtful and deliberate in our approaches. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of having difficult conversations, perhaps the, the most difficult ones are performance management. Um, Kate, in terms of performance management remotely, what are your key thoughts? And I'm conscious we're running out of time here, but what are your headlines on performance management and difficult conversations in a remote environment? Yeah, I'll whiz through. So we touched on it, but the first one is make sure you've got clear goals. That person does not know that they're not performing if they do not have a target to work to. So that's number one. Number two, I would recommend for most organizations, probably some form of performance appraisal twice a year and making sure that the results are communicated really clearly with the employee and that they're given regular feedback. You should be giving them feedback every week anyway via a one-to-one -one or something similar but I do think that a formal performance appraisal really helps them to understand how they're tracking. Obviously, don't be hesitant to use a PIP where it's necessary. If someone is really struggling with their performance, you need to make it very clear to them that they aren't meeting expectations and explain what good looks like for their role or for your organization. And I would also recommend trying follow-up comms. So after perhaps you've made a request or had a difficult conversation with someone remotely, via a call, via Zoom, whatever it might be, follow up in writing so that the employee can refer back to it and also so that they can digest and they have the opportunity to reflect, go through the feedback again if they need to. 
Fantastic. Thanks for that. Kate, uh, sorry, Amanda, anything? Uh, I'm trying to do some Q&A here. Yeah. We've got some questions oh, good. Anything you um, want to add to that? No, just the same as what I echoing what Kate says. The other thing is to have a good EAP available for both the leader and the staff member if there's some difficult conversations. Um, and as I said before, the ability to decompress or to debrief afterwards always allow that extra your HR your HR person as well should allow, you know, an extra 15, 20 minutes after just so you can have a wow, that was tough. Or wow, yeah. we did really well. Um and for, for both parties, I think that's really important. Yeah, EAP being Employee Assistance, Assistance Program. Program. And I think there's a couple of options available, including one through Employment Hero and others. When used properly, they can be very cost efficient, uh, considering the level of customised bespoke care they can provide. So if you haven't looked at EAP programs before, it might be worth looking into. Um, right, we're going to run out of time here, but some questions. One that I really liked was uh, in relation to headhunting and when you're going out and proactively chasing down your preferred employees, how 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 long when you get ghosted by that person they just don't respond? How long do you do you persist persist? How do you unlock that? How do you get them to answer you? When do you give up? Do I, Amanda? You come <laughs> off I think each each of my talent partners would have a different approach. Um, and it's a it's a sales role, you know. How do you how do you entice them? Do you drop them? Do you contact them? And then the next step might be dropping them a bit of an article on a back grow or a, a playbook or what we're doing. Um, at some point, you have to you have to give up. Unfortunately, you don't want to go down. You don't want to be seen as too desperate. Um, but you know, it's about selling the selling the story. Yeah, having a story and selling it. I think I'm going to just throw in here quickly, coming back to one of Kate's strategies that she's been developing, which is this idea of just having conversations. Yeah. And they may not be interested in you right now. Maybe after they've ghosted you a couple of times, maybe the answer is, hey, look, keep us in mind. We're always hiring. If it's not right right now, would you be, yeah. would you want to come and say hello, meet the CEO, have yeah. a conversation with the tech lead or whatever it might be, mm. and just get them engaged with, with maybe move away from that targeted, yeah. I want to hire you right now. Um, I, do, I do have a top tip, which I'll share. Maybe I'll regret it later. So after sending out whatever the message might be in mail, you know, whatever it is you're using, I find that straight after sending that, if you send the person a connection request and add a note to the connection request saying, hey, just contacted you about this role. I'm hoping that it might be of interest. Let me know if I can tempt you to a call. For whatever reason, I think that people are always active on whatever their notification requests are for new connections. And so they tend to see the message more quickly. And I find that my response rate is higher. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. We've had a question about um, recruiting internationally. Uh, I'm just going to jump straight in and, and provide our top tip here because it does relate to Smart Match. So if you're using Employment Hero, uh, the Smart Match functionality, which allows you to look at active candidates, and there was a question earlier around, are they actively looking? The way the Smart Match algorithm works is it prioritizes people based on how recently they've been active. So last 15 days, last 30 days, last 60 days, the deeper our talent pools in each particular role or location, the more recent they'll be, the thinner those pools we have to sometimes go back to 60 days. But um, in terms of using Smart Match, if you go in and find your Smart Matches, and if you've had a look at it, you'll know what I'm talking about, you can actually change the location. It typically defaults to wherever you've advertised for that role or your company headquarters. You can actually go in and just change the city. And if you change it to, say, Manila, or you change it to Cebu, or you change it to Los Angeles, Smart Match will automatically update with people who are based in those locations. So if you're considering... Uh, looking to recruit and build teams uh, externally, and you're already using Employment Hero, definitely play around with Smart Match. Look, I, I, we've run out of time. There's a bunch of questions. We will include responses to most of them in the emails, follow-ups that come along. Uh, in the meantime, I just want to thank uh, Amanda and Kate for joining us. Thank you very much for your time. If you want to continue those co conversations, you can find out more about Amanda and Kate through their LinkedIn profiles. I'm sure they'd be happy for you to um, to, to stalk them online and ask them questions. Amanda, Kate, thank you very much for joining us. If you've got further questions, feel free to get in touch via those, those um, platforms below. We will be emailing out the recording and some links to some of the things we've talked about and some uh, questions which are still flooding in. So thank you very much for all of those. With that, I think we'll wrap it up. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Cheers.